Like, hi, I'm Bob Costas. My <laughs> eyes are super fucking big. <laughs> he would have squeezed. Yeah. You are listening to the Bomb Hole. Bomb Hole Podcast. It's going to be very hot. It's going to be very uncomfortable for everybody. <laughs> the Bomb Okay, okay. I'm your host, Chris Grenier. We got my co-host, Stony Buds. What up? And uh, we got an incredible guest today. Absolutely incredible. T-Bird, a.k.a. Birdman, on the scene. 20 inches pop my feather. The Birdman dead. I fly in any weather. Any weather, boys. Rain, snow, sleet, or hail. Let's do this. I'm flying. There we go, yeah. Bird. How are we doing today, T-Bird? Doing good, man. Doing good. It's a beautiful day out. Um, honored to be sitting here with you guys. This is, I don't feel personally worthy, but it's its awesome. Thank you for having me. <laughs> I appreciate that. I want to really get into, you're, you're a New England guy, right? That's right. Grew up in a small town outside of Manchester, New Hampshire called Bedford. Yep. Bedford. Southern New Hampshire. Okay. We almost got your, your trifecta going on. Where are you from? Vermont. Massachusetts, New Hampshire. We're we're pretty close to having the whole New England area kind of area tight. covered. Kind of tight. And and you and Buds, you go you go way back, right? We go way back from my days not, at Snowboard. Not East Magazine. Coast back. Not East Coast back, but you way know, back. he was like one of the first people I met at Snowboarder basically when I started working there. T Bird showed Off. up with this red afro. I, I've seen tight. those. I've seen those. <laughs> um do you got any just quick Stony Bud stories just to jump right into off the top of your head? I mean, there's so many. I, here's one that constantly comes up between me and my homie Eamon because he was there for it. So we were at Super Park, uh, Mount Bachelor, Oregon. Um, actually, when this photo was taken right here, and they put us up in these condos at <clears throat> this place called Sun River. And so we get back from, you know, shooting and shredding and having just an incredible day. We're having beers on the back porch, and we're all kind of just wearing, like, our first layer stuff and stones in his boxer shorts. And he's just sitting there telling a story about something and me and Eamon are sitting there and Eamon's laughing like uncontrollably, <laughs> uncontrollably. And I'm like, I mean, this story is kind of funny, but it's, what's he laughing at? And Eamon just kind of taps me and he points down and Eastone has just the little hole in his boxer shorts and his, his cock is hanging out <laughs> and he's just going on and going on, like doesn't even feel the breeze. <laughs> And so Eamon and I are like losing it laughing. And then finally, like two minutes into the story, I kind of like point down to Stone and he just goes, oh shit, my dick's out. (laughs) Pops it back in the hole. Story continues. It was maybe the hardest I ever laughed in my life at that point. It was insane. That was the day I switched to boxer breeze. <laughs> do you think for uh, tradition's sake, we should do the whole whole interview dick out again dick just out, to kind of keep it going? <laughs> it was so good. I have to say, though, like, you two are probably the best, like, storytellers that I know. Now, imagine if your just dick was hanging out all the time. <laughs> you just, you'd be so much better at it. It's like, I'm not getting a lot of laughs. Hold on. Okay, here we go. Oh, shit. My dick's out. I still, dick's every, out, boys. Every once in a while, Eamon and I will just like randomly text each other like, oh, shit, my dick's out. And like, I know it just makes him start laughing and does the same for me. Classic. So good. Classic. Well, um, kind of just to, to take a couple steps back, uh, I kind of wanted to like go into your upbringing from uh, New Hampshire and kind of what that was like and how you got into snowboarding. It, it was awesome, man. It was like, I kind of had the quintessential childhood dream, right? Like we lived in a nice house and uh, we had tons of land to run around on. I grew up playing a ton of team sports because my dad was super into like football, basketball, baseball, soccer, all that stuff. Athlete. And he was, he was kind of the coach of all my teams. I'm not saying purebred athlete, but I mean, <laughs> look at the chassis. You know what I mean? Kid can run. Kid can run. <laughs> got, the kid's got wheels. Okay. Got wheels. <laughs> and then, you know, at a certain point, like a bunch of my buddies started skateboarding, uh, specifically my buddy Kevin Walsh, my buddy Mike Leonza, Mark Raish, all the, the homies from New Hampshire. So naturally I started skateboarding too. Um, and then that following winter, uh, you know, New Hampshire gets cold, gets snowy, you can't really skateboard that much outside. There were a couple little indoor parks here and there. Um, I just started snowboarding. Like I bought a full snowboard setup without even trying it once. I just like went to the local shop, bought the whole kit. I think it was like 480 bucks for like board, boot, bindings, outerwear, goggles. Damn, That's man. crazy. Mm-hmm. I want to say that was like 95, what 94, kind of 95. Um, it was a Libtech Jamie Lynn. 
Damn. With Preston bindings, Preston LX bindings. Remember those? Was that a ride mm-hmm. kind of sh- offshoot? Or something? Yeah, it was it a ride was, offshoot. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and then uh, the boots were Airwalks with the carrot on the tongue or something Sick. like that. Cool. Um, so, and I remember my my parents being like, are you sure you don't want to try it first? And I was like, yeah, there's no trying this. Like, You're this just is just like, what I'm going to do. do. Yeah. And so we started riding this tiny little hill that used to be like the garbage dump in Manchester that they just kind of filled in with dirt and blue snow on it. It was called McIntyre. Had one chairlift, one rope tow, and it was probably like three trails. And so me and my homie Mike would just lap McIntyre like all the time. And I remember seeing Matty Ryan Sick. and Luke Matheson. Yep. Wow. And they were oh, like, geez. it was crazy. Like they were just like ripping around, going nuts, like bonking lift towers, like all eating snow guns. And we were like, that is what we want to do. And yeah. it was just a full addiction uh, from there. Was your dad so bummed sick. from going to team sports and being your coach to switching? not really, but I eventually, so, so my parents ended up getting divorced, which was kind of a crazy experience. Cause I think now, um, it's much more common than it was back in the mid to late nineties. Like I didn't, I don't think I knew anybody except for like one or two people whose parents actually got divorced. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I was there with you, bud. <clears throat> totally. It was, it was a weird time to have your parents get divorced. People look at you kind of crazy, like. What's going on? Are you okay? Yeah. You're not okay. It's yeah. it's a life shattering event yeah. when that happens to you. How old were you? Uh, I mean, kind of guessing here, but I, I want to say like thirteen. You kind of yeah. black out. And it's yeah, hard like to remember seventh, these or, zones. seventh or eighth grade or something yeah. like yeah. that. Yeah, same time for That's me. Brutal. Yeah, and it, obviously it ended up being a great thing in the long run because you know I have an amazing stepfather, amazing stepmother, and my parents are happy now. But at the time, it was your fucking world just comes yeah. to a close for a long time. You, you didn't have to move states though, huh? No. So I stayed living in Bedford with my mom. My dad moved to York beach, Maine. Um, so he was still close, but at the same time I, I lost like my best friend at the time, you know, and my Sucks. brother ended up moving out too and going to a private school. And then he moved in with my dad. Um, so I kind of lost my brother and my dad to this divorce at the same time. And I was just like in this crazy fucking whirlwind of of headspace yeah. right it was just me and my mom living in the house i grew up in and i just kind of didn't have anyone to play with anymore so that almost pushed me more to skateboarding and snowboarding like that was my release it's all i wanted to do so much so that i eventually just pretty much quit every single sport um <clears throat> that I, team sport that i was playing with the exception of soccer um because I've, I've just always loved soccer i still play soccer uh but it just like it closed my universe down to where I could like focus on this little nucleus of energy um, and like rebellion and, you know, like start fucking around in the city, like breaking stuff here and there a little bit and like maybe smoking a little bit of weed and like trying alcohol for the first time. But you're not falling into other things that could get you in more trouble. You're just a kid playing. You're just not you're not playing a sport. You're just like running around a city playing games. Yeah. Basically is what it is. It's yeah. My yeah. release at that time was masturbation. <laughs> either, either way. Well, Whatever I, works I think for that, you, I know. think it's like, it's such a common thing between like almost everybody we talk to and myself where when you don't like what you got going on at home, you always, you kind of find snowboarding or skateboarding and that's your, that's your escape from your home life. When you're going through a tough divorce with, you know, your parents, is this my fault? Or whatever's going on in your head, it's brutal. But then that's what makes you really fall in love with, like, the escapist snowboarder. Exactly. Yeah. It, was a, it was a release. Like, it, you know, you talk about, <clears throat> like, wanting to get out of home. I didn't even really want to be home. Yeah. It, it, like, my mom was really sad. I know my dad was really sad uh, up in Maine um, about how everything went down. And I just didn't want to be in my house. Yeah. Ever. It's crazy you and your brother split up. Yeah. yeah. That yeah. usually doesn't happen. I he think, ended yeah. up going up to a... It was your guy's choice? Uh, it was, yeah, it was Gary went up, my brother, Gary, awesome dude, um, went up to a school in, uh, New Hampton, New okay. Hampshire. Yep. And then did a couple years there and then moved yep. to Maine with my dad, which was a great thing for him because yeah. where we were like, wasn't a good place for him. You know, like he needed like a little more structure and stuff like that. Yeah. He's um, a cop, correct? He's a police officer, a state trooper. Don't give him my number, man. No, I won't. <laughs> I won't. Cops. Cool. <laughs> well, moving forward a little bit in your, in your little bit later years, you, Went to Plymouth State, and there was Blue Lodge era. That seemed like it was yeah. insane. Yeah, right? <clears throat> and it's kind of crazy, too, because when I was in high school, uh, I went to Manchester West High School, yep. same school as Luke Matheson. Maddie Ryan went to Memor- Memorial. Okay. Um, there are four schools in the greater Manchester area. I went to West High. 
kind of became buddies with Luke Matheson. And then I, <clears throat> when I was in high school, I was actually like pretty, pretty, I don't want to say severely. I was, I was pretty learning disabled. You like I, I was crazy. in, I was in actually like one of the smartest people. Yeah. I know, that is dude. insane. <laughs> yeah, it well was, articulated. It was wild. Maybe it was because of like what I was going through yeah. at the time and, and how my life was just kind of like all over the place. But I was, uh, I was like super ADHD. I oh, had like, you no, are, yeah, you got that. I mean, I still kind of have yeah, you it. You got that. Um, I had like no attention span whatsoever. And so I <clears throat> got put into special education class once a day where I'd like take all my tests, do all my studying, just like a very quiet space where I could like mm-hmm. just gather my thoughts with a, with a teacher named Tina Benhart. I don't know if you guys know Andy Benhart, but he's buddies with Preston Strout, Brian Barb, cool. Shane Flood. He was one of the Blue Lodge dudes. Yeah. So I'm sitting there in this class and Tina was like, hey, Tom, you're super into like snowboarding and skateboarding, right? And I was like, yeah, I am. And she's like, I'm going to bring you in some photos to show you where my uh, son goes to school and you can check it out. And so the next day she brings in these little five by seven printouts and it's the rails in the backyard of the Blue Lodge. Wow, and this is, this is my senior year of, of high school, maybe my junior year of high school. And so I'm like, that's incredible. That's ridiculous. And she's like, yeah, my son and, you know, 20 of his friends live at this old abandoned ski lodge. Um, they hike the backyard. They got rails. They ride Waterville and Loon every day. You know, I didn't have super good grades to go to college, but it wasn't super hard to get into Plymouth. So that then became my goal. I was like, I'm going to Plymouth, going to meet these Blue Lodge guys, get in good with them and just go to college and snowboard every day. And that ultimately is what ended up happening. I like, you know, squeaked by uh, high school. I think my GPA was like... 2.4, 2.6, like just enough to get in, applied to Plymouth, got in, and it was like game on. The first uh, first real night <clears throat> that I had at Plymouth, I went to a snowboard club meeting, and I walked right up to Andy Benhart, and I was like, hey, your mom was my Lodge. teacher, and he was like, hey, what's up, man? Come skate the ramp, and it was just like... And you guys could live in this old ski lodge. I didn't realize that's what the Blue Lodge was. Yeah, so I never lived there, but we would just go there every day. Like these dudes were became like our our idols at the time right? yeah yeah that's like the east coast snowboarders dream right there like it's pretty incredible they'd have these like huge parties um they had a skate a whole like mini skate park on the deck uh they had rails in the backyard and although like you know we weren't the coolest dudes like we weren't like fully in with them yet it just gave me like the next step of um you know, on the set of stairs of like what to aspire yeah. to, you know, like I, I found my little group of friends, uh, at Plymouth, which was like Jacques Barrio, Reed Kasner, Eamon Rabira, Brian Norton shouts. Yeah. The homies, like the best of homies. And so we became this like kind of the next generation of like Plymouth dudes who were super into the snowboard it, scene. It's crazy. The lineage that the Plymouth state snowboard club has, because it's gone from you guys and then like it keeps going and you have like Cole St. Martin and Rav yep. and those guys and Chris Johnny Carr. O'Connor, Chris Carr was that, that was kind of my crew I was running with and uh, it's still going today. And it's just like, it's been this kind of East coast, like basically factory for producing like awesome riders and getting a college degree. Yeah. So. It's funny. Like y- you look at the members of the snowboard industry that have come out of Plymouth and I don't know if there's another college yeah, I keep meeting more and more, just like, being like, "Well, you're from there too." Everyone jokes that it's it's like snowboarding secret, like Illuminati that nobody <laughs> that, like, nobody knows about that has a drinking problem, probably. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> but it's just such a it was such a cool place for me to go to college, and that's when I kind of like you know got off Ritalin and stuff like that because it was the Ritalin wasn't really good for me, and I met the right people and like really hunkered down and like focused on my studies and realized that. Like, hey, I'm probably not going to be a pro snowboarder because these guys started coming up to Loon and basically winning every contest. And so we were like, all right, we're not as good as those dudes. How can we continue to, like, stay in this? And that's when I found uh, that I really liked English and writing and reading and, and just learning more. And as, like, the science and math kind of went away, as I pursued this um, higher education goal of being, like, an English major with a – minor in writing, my grades got better and better and better. And I kind of found my own flow and like became my own person that, you know, probably wouldn't have happened if I didn't go to college. I, I think about if I didn't go to Plymouth or if I even went to another school yeah. and didn't meet the the good homies that I, that I currently have, I have no clue what I'd be doing. It's just yeah. about finding what you wanted in college to actually work on so you could do good at it, huh? Exactly. And school change yeah. for you. 
Yeah, you were interested, so you actually started excelling more yeah. so than like when you didn't give a shit. But totally. Um, um, and then it seems like the next step from there, you kind of got a crazy phone call from Ben Fee, as I remember, or something where you just kind of moved out west on a whim. Yeah, so it's like <clears throat> I I graduated from Plymouth in May of two thousand five. Went back and lived at my mom's house in, uh, she had moved to Goffstown at this point, just one town over from Bedford. And uh, I was just like painting houses in the neighborhood and I worked for this dude, just painting new construction and stuff, not really knowing what I was going to do. Ended up moving out to Tahoe that uh, following winter um, and had the best time ever. I got fired from like two jobs. <laughs> I, I eventually just stopped going to work because it was an amazing winter and we were just like snowboarding as much as possible. And then I flew back home, kept painting houses. And then it kind of had this like come to Jesus moment where I'm like, what the fuck am I actually doing? Like, I got to figure something out. I can't just like move back to Tahoe again and then keep moving home and, and get into that, that cycle. Um, <clears throat> not that there's anything wrong with that. It's just, a hard cycle, just for me, it, I knew it wouldn't work. And so easy random, to get, easy to get stuck in that cycle. Yeah, super easy to get stuck in that cycle. And yeah. then who knows where I'm going to end up at that point, you know? So I, you know, my buddy, Ben Fee, one of you remember Ben, you guys, yeah. he's the best. He's literally like one of the funniest humans I've ever met in my he's life. Awesome. Um, I knew he had gotten a job at snowboarder and I would always text him and call him like, what's it like? And this and that. And, um, he finally called me one day and he's like, yo, uh, what are you doing this coming fall? And I was like, I don't know, man, I might go back to Tahoe. I'm just painting houses now trying to save up some money. And just randomly, he's like, why don't you come out and start working at the Mac? And I was like, is that chill? Is that cool? <laughs> and he's like, yeah, man, come on out. Like you can live with me. We'll go into the office. So and so here I am a kid. I'm like running into the house. I'm like, mom, I think I just got a job at snowboarder magazine. She's like, that's incredible. Sell my car, sell everything I own, pack a board bag. And I buy a one-way ticket to San Diego. The first day I get to the office, Bridges walks out and he's like, who are you? And I, was, <laughs> I was like, uh, hey, man, I'm T-Bird. I'm here for the new job. He had no fucking clue who I was. Like, ben just set you up or what? Ben just straight up didn't, I don't think he mentioned me. Or if he, he forgot did, to follow through. Pat totally forgot yeah. that they had spoken. And so here I am, this kid who had just moved to, I was living in Huntington Beach, California, in a tent on Ben's back porch. I bought this like Walmart tent and I was living on this like, you know, eight by 10 porch. Um, and so I just like, broke down. I'm like, what am I doing? Other this side is of the country. A while too. I was as far away from New Hampshire as you could feasibly get. <laughs> yeah. Literally living Sold on everything. the Pacific yeah. Ocean. Yeah. And I was just like, what am I doing? Um, but, you know, lo and behold, I kind of stuck it out. And obviously Bridges saw that I was like really into it um, and eventually got hired. Uh, but so Ben's master master plan or, or big vision was that he knew he was leaving the following spring. So I did a winter kind of interning at the mag and I was going in there five days a week and then working at Jack's garage in Huntington beach yep. six nights a week. Uh, so Ben, you know, gives us two weeks notice and then it was like next man up. I started as associate editor in June of 2007, like full time salary benefits, all that stuff. And that's when it was like game on. Yeah, yeah, Ben I, was kind of, he knew what he was doing then. He was setting you up for his he, replacement. <laughs> he fully did. Just didn't tell Pat about it. <laughs> yeah, but there is a, there's a really cool story. <clears throat> Probably comes at like my darkest hour in Southern California. I was completely out of money, didn't have a car. I was getting a ride to the office every day with Ben and then kind of riding my bike to Jack's at night. And, uh, you know, I, I, I talked to Pat. I was like, dude, I can't do this anymore. You know, I was like on the phone with my mom. I was like, I have no money. This is just isn't working. And my mom's like, well, you can just fly home if you want. I'll buy you a ticket home. And <clears throat> I told that to Pat and he's like, just stick it out. You know, like we'll figure something out. So I go into the office the next day and I had this like little cubicle that wasn't even in the snowboarder zone. It was like way off above the surfer magazine guys. And there was a, a little like G10 or G9 camera because Pat knew I like wanted to start shooting photos and an envelope with like a thousand bucks cash in it. And it was, wow. it was from Pat. Wow. Wow. Yeah. He was like, just. I was like, I can't take this money. And he's like, take the money. I think it just came out of his own personal bank That's account. That's how he does it, huh? Yeah. And he was like, let me figure something out. This should buy you some time. In and it was like. Incredible. Yeah. And I can only imagine how much you appreciated that being in like that low of a place and being like. Yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. It was a mix of emotions of like feeling really guilty about taking the money, but also knowing that 
that would help me get to my end goal. Yeah, and to have the camera, that's incredible. God, I, I love hearing that stuff because that, that always, like, I love hearing that stuff because it's it's like if you had just walked in there and gotten the job, you probably wouldn't have appreciated it. No. But the fact that you had to sleep on a porch and just, like, on a tent, in a tent, and yeah. tough it out, then when you probably finally got that job, you are just like... It was insane. And, and Ben... Literally, this is what Ben did for me. He got my foot in the door, gave me a place to live, set me up with my dream job. And then as he was cleaning his closet out to move, I think he was moving up to LA or something to shoot some music video stuff and <clears throat> pursue like a little more um, video centric career. He pulled out this uh, Nikon D70 and he was like, yeah, this thing doesn't work. Do you want it? And I was like, hell yeah. And it had a little 50 millimeter lens on it. And so I just brought it to a camera store, got it fixed for like 200 bucks, and it was like off and running. Boom, game, you got a camera. Game on. I had my first real digital camera. Yeah. Yeah. Damn. So you, you were kind of, you were a writer turned photographer, huh? Is that how, that, you never shot photos before that? I didn't realize that. No, I, I mean, I had messed around in college with my friends and stuff like that, but I, I was way more into writing at that time yeah. and trying to be like a, like a magazine writer rather than a photographer. But early on in my career at Snowboarder, I kind of realized that I guess in order to be great at any one thing you have to be good at a bunch of different things you have to like constantly reinvent yourself <clears throat> so one year i was at a uh, super park and joel muzzy was the photo editor legend legend there east coast go. royalty that dude's yep. incredible and i remember him kind of saying like yo you know this is before ben gave me the camera he's like you should get a camera like these are the best snowboarders on planet earth and yeah you know you're just kind of standing good around advice. Yeah. and i was like yeah, if if all else, I could just shoot, have some good photos for my archive. Um, and then I was also lucky enough, you know, to start traveling on the magazine's dime and shooting photos of like a vast array of like really good snowboarders. But on top of that, I had Stone, Oli, Espin, uh, Aaron Dodds to to be like... Legendary photogs. Yeah, just the, the greatest of all time, really. Yep. Like that, that resume or that portfolio there is like pretty untouchable. Mm -hmm. Um and so I could just kind of turn to those guys and be like, yo, is this, is this dope? Is this cool? Stone would be yeah, like, oh, the get, good? What's get a little up? more bit of the takeoff, get yeah. a little more of the landing. And so I, you know, I don't, I'm not like a, I don't want to say I'm not like a well-taught photographer. I'm a self-taught, I'm a self-taught yeah. photographer. You know, yeah. like I, I know exactly what I need to know. All the other technical back end stuff I've learned along the way. You know, you pick up from being around guys like so. You've probably seen his progress, buds. He's, he's well, come you know what's way. cool is at first he was coming on trips with us as a writer. We'd go to like Turkey, Estonia. He would bring his camera along and be like, "Is it cool if I shoot?" And I was like, "Of course." And he started just shooting hammers. You know, he'd ask the questions and shoot like some second angle stuff. That was back in the days when a magazine would send a photographer and, and a writer. A writer. <laughs> and then, wow. and glory, then days. glory days. Sometimes yes. a filmer too. Yeah. And then a whole crew of writers. Mm -hmm. But <clears throat> the stories that Stone and I have from the road are ridiculous. Yeah. Like some of the trips we've been on. Yeah, have where you been, guys been? Where have we been together? Uh, Istanbul, Turkey. We went, we went to Turkey. All over Turkey. Estonia. We went to Estonia. Went to Bulgaria. 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 <laughs> might, have, might have partied till 6 a.m. on like <laughs> like seven nights of the trip or something. <laughs> so so we, we fly to Sofia, Bulgaria, go up to the resort uh, Bansko. Bansko. Mm -hmm. And so it, the crew was me, Stone. Who was the filmer on that? Was it Cole? Dude, it's almost a blackout. For it's me. almost a blackout. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And then I know Marco Grilch was there, right? The riders were uh, Marco Grilch, MFM, Bittner, and Stevie, Stevie Bell. Bell. I remember the story. I think it was Cole, maybe. I don't know. I think it Someone's was Cole. Someone's going to be mad at us, but yeah. I mean, they can't blame us. Yeah, I think we it were, was Cole, though. We were partying nonstop. Yeah, it was Cole. And so the very first night we're there, we party till 6 a.m. and sleep until 5 p.m. the <laughs> next day. <laughs> Literally, well, we all woke up at like 5 and we were like, Fuck. <laughs> and then I think it happened again the second yeah. night. I don't think we snowboarded the For first days. two days that we were there. And it was insane. One was night, messed up. me and Stone go out, and I think it was just you and I. It was I. just us that night. We were just doing this. <laughs> and, and we go to this bar. I think I still have this photo. We meet these, like, English dudes, and we're hamming it up and chugging a couple beers, this and that, and things just spiral out of control, and we start doing shots and all this stuff. And there was, like, a crosswalk outside the bar. 
and they were like, hey, do you want us, I'm not going to try to do a British accent. They're like, you want us to recreate the Abbey Road Beatles cover? And we're like, of course. <laughs> yeah, we're <laughs> like, let's do this. Let's do this. And so we shoot the, you told the them we were photo. photographers. You know? yeah. <laughs> Stoney shoots the photo. And then one of them's like, do you want us to do it butt naked? <laughs> And we're sure. like, absolutely. <laughs> so these these dudes just strip off all their clothes and they're just like posing in the middle of the street. Fully naked. Fully naked. <laughs> in Bulgaria. In and Bulgaria. We just never <laughs> saw them again. That was just, that Insane. was it. Yeah. Insane. And then MFM saved my life. <clears throat> yeah, some, tur- some where were we? Bulgaria? Some dude threw a rock at Tibor. Or you threw a rock People at throwing him, rocks? Someone threw a what rock the at hell is going on? People are throwing rocks? So we went or to this like, hole? yeah, like a kebab stand or something like that. And there were all these stray dogs around. So we're like eating kebabs and we're like, I'm like throwing them fries. And this guy comes out and yells at me and I come to find out he didn't want me feeding the stray dogs cause they didn't want them around the yeah, business. Then they swarm. So he's like yelling at me and I'm like, yeah, okay, whatever. Keep throwing them, whatever. All of a sudden he comes up with this huge rock <laughs> and I just feel it whiz by my ear. He threw this thing hard. Like Holy if it had shit. hit me in the head, Game KO'd. over. It yeah. would have been bad. Yeah. And Marco, I think he ripped his shirt off, chased the dude down the street. Yeah, he was I'll ready kill, to go. I'll fuck you up. I'll kill you. And I was just like, as a as a what a legend, twenty four year old dude being like, Mark Frank Montoya has my back. <laughs> like if you had told me that when I was fifteen, yeah, I, I would have just like, I, there's no way I would have believed you. Oh my god, there's Incredible. basically no laws there, so anything no. could happen. The guy could have thrown the Mark- rock at him, or Mark could have beat him down. Yeah. Marco could probably kill just about. Anybody that yes. he fought, guaranteed. There Seen aren't him, many people it. that I initially like really fan out on when I met him, but I, I asked Stone. I was terrified to meet yeah. Marco. Terrified. And then he's the nicest guy ever, right? He was the Once sickest you get to dude. Know him. Yeah. So sick. But so he was. Sick. He was terrified. So um, I'd just like to get into a quick little segment we do, name that video part, uh, just to keep things moving. It's a fun little fan favorite. Um, yeah. What do you think, Bird? You want to get right into it? I'm down. Let's go. Okay. Okay, it's a two-parter. The first one's for Bird. The second one is for the listeners. We're going to queue up Birdman's. How you feeling, Bird? Let's go. All right, let's hit it. <laughs> you know what that is? Yeah, that's Sports Center. <laughs> yes, it is. It's Sports yes, Center it is. right there. It's not a video part, but it's something you probably watch more than video parts, I I'd do. imagine. I do. I figured I'd play something that you're you're tuned into. I love it. At first I was like, is that <laughs> You're like, what video part is, is that this? the segue into it? Yeah, I mean I'm a big, big Patriots fan, big sports guy. Let's go. That yeah. Way. All right. Shouts out to Sports Center. All right, and then this one's for the fan. As always, we got a little prize pack for you. First one to comment on the Instagram. That knows the song will send something out for you. Take me now, open road. Take me as far away from here as I can go. All right. You guys know what that is? I think so. Oh, don't say it if you do. We'll talk about it after. Yeah. Yeah. But I think so. Um, I wouldn't have known, but we talked about it. Bud's so. rarely. Rarely knows. Rarely it knows. is. It does get hard. <laughs> Sometimes you're like. You can just see the action happening, yeah. but you can't like. That's what happens to me. Picture the rider. Yeah, you're like, I remember this, but I just don't. I don't have the capacity for that. So, and um, another thing I kind of want to talk about is I've heard a rumor that you have over 200 farts recorded on your phone. 273. Wow. And counting. 73. Wow. 273. Respect. Yeah, I got. I. I. I mean, anyone who knows me really well knows that the funniest thing in the world to me is a fart. There's, there's no question about it. It, <laughs> it, it defies language oh, yeah. barriers. Oh yeah, it really does. People of all ages enjoy them. It is the universal joke. Yeah, right? absolutely. And uh, I'll steal a line from my buddy Preston Strout. It's like, if I'm on my deathbed, and right before I go, someone, someone beefs, my last breath will be like a light chuckle. <laughs> like I will never not <laughs> laugh at a fart. I just simply can't. You know, and as you guys know, I've recently become a dad two and a half years ago. Got an yeah. amazing daughter named Eloise. We call her Louie. Shout and out to Louie. Shout out to Louie. Lou Dog, what's up? Um, yeah, that's kind of like my main tenet of parenting. If if she can go through her entire life, no matter if she's in a good mood or a bad mood, and laugh at a fart, how that's not a bad thing. That's a win. That's yeah. a great thing. That's yeah. awesome. So you were, what were you saying about the angles in the chair or something? Well, yeah, I used to remember you told me you could set it up on a hurt certain hard chair and make them go longer or sound louder with a 
Yeah, you can kind of control. Technique. You can kind of control them technique. a little bit. <laughs> I would say this this mesh material wouldn't be good. No bueno. Yeah, you need like it's almost hard, a fart diffuser. Hard plastic or like a cherry wood. You need that for <laughs> like a like a church like a church pew would probably have a nice like oh yeah like church, you need that, like that for like good resistance. Plastic school chairs <laughs> and also <laughs> it comes Big down. Rubbers. It also comes down to the fabric that you have draped over your lower half, right? So okay. you you're going to want fabrics that work. You're going to want a thin fabric. Okay. Like a, like a boxer brief. You don't want it to be muffled. No a thick jeans, sweatpants gonna, No gonna sweatpants. Mute. I mean maybe if they're like really thin sweatpants. Yeah. There's an there's an art to it that I feel like I've perfected. But it's like I've just always found them so funny in any situation and it quite frankly drives my wife crazy <laughs> because <laughs> Like, she is the greatest human I've ever met. She's so much better than I am and so much more attractive than I am. And every time we're in a grocery store and there's, like, a stranger down at the end of the aisle, I'll just kind of let one rip. And she... <laughs> just in the open. She's like, God damn it, Bernie. Yeah, she just holds her composure, but I'm sure it drives her absolutely And she, you'll nuts. be doing that for the rest of your life. The so remainder of my what life. So yeah. what's the rumor I've been hearing about these, like, night tooths or in the middle I, of the night? I was his roommate on a lot of trips. Oh, you can, you can vouch for it. I can it vouch firsthand. for this, Okay. Man. Yeah, his roommate, his body wakes up. I mean, I don't even know if he knows he's doing it. I, I oh, yeah, don't. Yeah, he's, yeah. A, he's, a, he's, he's out. sleeping. He's out cold. Okay. It's probably five o'clock in the morning. He's an early <laughs> riser. His his butthole wakes up before his brain, <laughs> and he just starts ripping these <laughs> like loud, long ones. And it's like the gases are moving. He's awake, and it, it's loud enough to actually wake me up. And uh, it's I've never heard anything like it in my life from anyone. <laughs> And he has no idea. I'll be like, dude, you're farting again at 530. And he's just like, oh, wow, well, okay. Yeah, I don't quite know what it is. I'm just, I am an extremely gassy individual. There's no, there's no, there's no way around it. Are you Italian? Monterosso? It's yeah. Gonna, yeah. Do you know what it, do you know what my last name translates to no. in Italian? No. The Red Mountain. Oh, no fucking way. <laughs> True story. <laughs> yeah. Hey, did you see, uh, we got you and uh, Danny Bonaducci on the wall? Yeah. Uh, I I have of the Red seen Mountain. I've seen those stickers literally all over the country. <laughs> That's like, so sick. I had, I was actually I forget what mountain I was at. Maybe it was like troll hogging or something like that. And I was like you know lapping, and this kid is holding his board, and he looks at me, and then looks at the sticker, and he's just like. <laughs> And I was like, hey, what's up, man? How you doing? He had no idea what it was. <laughs> like, no clue. He was just like, I, I don't know how he had the sticker, but he instantly just was like, got the sticker. I'm like, holy shit, that's the dude. <laughs> I was like, what's up? You dog? look a lot like the dude that looks like Danny Bonaducci <laughs> to me. Pretty incredible. <laughs> it was pretty incredible. That's classic. Yeah. Insane. Um, yeah, kind of rolling back into some of the mag story stuff. Like, you. You've done some pretty prolific articles, and one particular that that Jamie Lynn one really hit. That was one yeah. of the best things I've I've ever read in my life. Yeah, that was a wild one, man. It's, did you actually read it? I did. It's, <laughs> <I'm just kidding. laughs> I did read it. Yeah, dude, I actually it changed my life for reading. I started really? reading all his shit after that. Really, it was, yeah. it was wild, man. It was. I think of all the you know features or interviews or columns or articles that I wrote for a Snowboarder. That was hands down the the one I'm most proud of. If anyone said like, give us you, your written body of work that you're most proud of. I'd, I'd slide that one right across the yep. table. <clears throat> but it's also the story behind it is so crazy because, you know, I had done um, a full length feature like profile piece on Jeremy Jones, Big Mountain Jeremy Jones back in the day. BMJJ. BMJJ. <laughs> um, and I actually went to Svalbard, <laughs> Norway <laughs> to like finish the interview with him and went winter camping like, oh, like a hundred and I heard about this this story is this, fucked this up. One. It was like 200 miles from the North Pole yeah. or something like that. Like yeah. constant daylight. The sun was just circling. That was just to get the interview with Jeremy, you know, to, yeah. to we, finish the article. We got to talk about that. Yeah. yeah, that's a crazy one. Um, and so I don't know. I still to this day don't know if Jamie read that and contacted Billy, but Billy Anderson contacted me one day and he was like, hey, Jamie wants to tell his story. To you. I assume so. I assume so, because he was like, fly up to Seattle on this day. Yeah. Um, I'd never met Jamie Lynn before. I think I had seen him one time at Mount Hood when I was working at High Cascade as like a counselor and just didn't, didn't yeah. have it in me to go, see, to go say hi to him. Um, so I buy this ticket to Seattle. And then, you know, Billy was like, rent a car. Jamie will get dropped off. He's going to hop in with you, and you guys are going to roll up to Crystal. So I rent like a, I think it was like an Escalade. The lady was like, "Do you want to upgrade?" And I was like, "Yeah, Dope. sure, yeah, whatever." Hell yeah. So uh, you know, I get Bird this, man. I get this text, <laughs> <laughs> and 
And, and it's Jamie, and he's like, hey, I'm on the curb. So I go pick him up, and he just hops in the car, lights a cig, and just starts rapping out. He's like, how was the flight, brother? And I was just like, what the fuck is going on? It was the craziest experience ever. Um, and the first, like, three or four days of the trip, we didn't talk about anything. And we were staying at this rental house right on the mountain at Crystal that we had to, like, take a snow cat to to get to. And so one night, you know, we're, like, drinking a couple beers, and Jamie's like, so uh, you want to go? you want to go do this brother? And I'm like, <laughs> he's just ready. Yeah, let's go. <laughs> so we just go down into the, into the basement and he just tells, it was a tell all, tell all. literally everything. The story was amazing. Yeah. The highs, the lows. I mean, like he was like, I'm the first, I think I'm the first snowboarder to make a million and blow a million like <laughs> in a lifetime. That's and I was I, like, my mind was exploding as he was telling me this. And it was the most nervous I've ever been interviewing someone dude like, that's someone i i fan out to that dude but every, then after yeah. you get to know him you're just like damn this is the coolest guy alive yeah but you still fan out you're still oh, like you just got the Lynn. like legendary vibe yeah. no matter what you're like oh fuck, dude, that still Jamie happens Lynn, to no me what to, coolest cat to this yeah. day like with friends of mine yeah where you know legendary pro snowboarders that i'm now lucky enough to be friends with where in my head i'm just like this is this motherfucker this is unbelievable that that this has panned out this way Right. And Jamie picking you for this. That's so cool. Yeah. And, you know, I don't want to be too presumptuous and say he did, but I assume, you know, they Otherwise, hit me up. Otherwise, Pat and probably they... would have jumped on that plane. Yeah, yeah I think I'm so. I'm sure yeah. Bridges would have loved to <laughs> yeah. do that one. For and, sure. And then what you were mentioning earlier, I remember hearing that story when you went and the, the polar bears and shit. The Jamie, <laughs> the, the, the big mountain Jeremy Jones story. Yeah, that one. That's was, a crazy one. That too. one was crazy. And it was a really fun one to do because because yeah. anytime you hang out with. Big Mountain Jones, he just, like, pushes you to the next level. Like, I was fully not ready to go on that trip. But I did a, you know, earlier season mission with him in Tahoe. We started the interview process. I hung out with his uh, wife and his kids. Like, beautiful, awesome, amazing family. And then I didn't really hear from... Massachusetts him. native, fun fact. Sorry to That's interrupt. right, Cape Cod. <clears throat> yep. 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 Um, and so I didn't really hear from him for the rest of the winter because he was filming further, the second of his three movies. Um, so he was super busy doing his thing. And then I just didn't have what I needed. So he just, either he texted me or I texted him one day, like, yo, you want to finish this thing up? Sure. Let's do it. He just sends me like a pin and he's like, this is where we're headed. Contact this guiding operation, put your deposit down. And I'm like, looking at him like Saval Bard. Like, what is the deal with this place? And I knew forum or Foursquare had been there for North, South, East, West. So I kind of assumed we were just going in the city and we were going to kind of do some day missions. Land in Long Yerbien, Norway. Um, and, you know, I had, like, my tent and my split board and stuff like that. We go to this hangar, and Jeremy's just, like, packing sleds full of gear. And I'm like, where, where are we headed? <laughs> <laughs> where, where are we going? And, uh, you know, he's got, like, the TGR guys with him. They're all super gnarly. I had never split boarded a day in my life. <laughs> but I had, had actually, all the stuff. I, so I had actually gotten a split board, like, a week before and set it all up in my little patio backyard in Southern California, like, drilling the holes and all this, and then just kind of packed it up and got on the plane. Fast forward back to the hangar. We're, like, packing all this stuff up, and um, it was Jeremy Jones and then Terry A. Hawkinson. Jeez. Wow, heavy hitters. It was pretty wild. That's another yeah. one I'll fan out on right there. Yeah, and then the photographer trip. was this dude, Dan Milner, who's like a phenomenal, you know, just outdoor photographer in general, be it mountain biking, snowboarding, skiing, whatever it may be. Two days later, we hop on snowmobiles, um, and we're doubling up, taking turns. And it, I mean, it took us like 18 hours to get there. We, we finally, Jeez. yeah, I had no clue that this was going to be like as gnarly That's as it was. That's a mission, dude. And I was completely unprepared and unqualified to be on a trip with these guys. <laughs> um, and yeah, we, we did it. And you know, we had the, that's what I wanted to talk yeah, about. Yeah, It was like trip wires. For every perimeter. night. Yeah. Yeah. We had these trip wires uh, with magnesium flares that, you know, if a polar bear was sniffing around and it hit one of these things, it would like fire this like red hot light and heat and it would make a crazy hissing sound and it would scare them off. Um, and I think one of our guides or two of our guides would like kind of rotate, staying awake throughout the night, <clears throat> um, Stay on just watch. to kind of keep an eye on things. Cause we were just in this big glacial Valley after, you know, heading up this, um, kind of like frozen river sort of thing. And we just, we were just posted up there for, for a long time, but everyone in the crew at one point or another would set off the magnesium trip wires <laughs> like every morning you'd hear like a loud pop and then like a flash and they'd be like fuck and you'd be like oh loser <laughs> like making fun of them 
Um, but yeah, it was, it was an incredible trip. And then I ended up having to leave early. I had to snowmobile back with one of our guides and it took us a lot quicker time to get back than it did to get out. I think it was like seven or eight hours to get back to long year bin. Um, cause I had to go to fucking super park where this photo was <laughs> shot. And so I had just spent like a couple weeks, um, in 24 hours of daylight. Like we're so high north. Oh yeah. Yeah. The sun didn't go this way. Mm-hmm. It just spun around. Spins around. Crazy. And so like it was just full shock plus jet lag and yeah and so you're like roll up to super park day one and stone's like yo what's up Birdman?" i'm like i don't know (laughs) i literally (laughs) don't know what the fuck is going on right now please tell me i flew straight here from norway i've been hanging out with big mountain jeremy jones in a tent trying not to get mauled by polar bears basically incredible and then on the way back we we saw three of them so we didn't see any of the whole trip when they're we were out vicious, there. They're vicious, right? Aren't they? I, I guess so. I mean, you these, saw three sledding back. Yeah, these ones were like pretty far away, but I'm like following this dude. And we had to get one of my snowmobile um, skids fixed at like a little trapper house because I'd like hit a rock or something like that. Um, and so, you know, we start the sleds back up and we're rolling. And this dude had this like huge like revolver, like 44 Magnum revolver on his hip or whatever. Just this gnarly guy that didn't talk much. So we're just kind of putting along across this, uh, this fjord. And then I just see him go like this and he just kills his sled, kills my sled. And I'm like, what's going on? And he's just like, you could see him like sniffing it out. He's like, <laughs> I'm like, what the fuck is this guy doing? Like the, the most, You're all, did I fart? <laughs> like the most mountain man of mountain men I've ever met. And he's just like there. And you just see like these fucking polar bears just, walking around that and is amazing he's like if they come at us get behind me and i was just like man i feel so emasculate right <laughs> yeah. now he's literally gonna pull out the <laughs> biggest gonna, like, gun in the world and take him. it down in one shot it was wild it was wild Gar. so i get back to the little hostel i was staying at in long year being take like three showers because i smelled like a garbage dump and then i go outside and i call my wife uh, girlfriend at the time and she she's like hey you're safe i'm like yeah i'm flying home tomorrow morning i'm gonna go get a couple beers yada 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 she's like did you hear what what happened while you were gone and i was like no and she goes um they killed obama and i was like the <laughs> fucking president's dead <laughs> and she's like no 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 sorry osama bin Laden. <laughs> and i'm like Jesus Christ, you can't do that shit to me. Yeah. Like, my heart the dropped. President. I'm like, I love that I, guy. I was in the North Pole. I'm like, so Biden's the fucking president? <laughs> like, losing my mind. Dude, and then she, was like, starts cracking up. She's like, sorry, I said it wrong. It's Osama bin Dude, Laden. I'm speaking like, of your wife, you guys re- wedding? Oh, wow. like, that was fucking... That was head. like the Hangover 4 or whatever. That was, Dude, let's that talk was, about that it. That was out of a I'll, movie. I'll get you guys some... I'll text you some photos to, like, plug into the show, oh, too. Because, yeah, like, please. that was the... Hands down, the greatest, most fun, most insane day of my life. And, like, and many other people's lives. Yeah. It was <laughs> insane. And here's what did the whole thing. We hired Matty Mo, best DJ in town. Shouts right. to Matty Mo. Shouts to Matty Mo. Dude's Mo. incredible. And so Matty Mo is like, hell yeah, Birdman, I got you. So he like, a couple days before the wedding, um, he's like, you know, do you guys want to make a playlist? I'm like, no, you got this club bangers. Let's get yep. people dancing. Yep. And he just kind of like hits me up. He's like, yo, should I bring my fog machine? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like on the phone. I'm like, yeah, it could hurt. That was it. Dude. That was it. That was it. Yeah. If there was no fog machine, it would have been a great time, but it felt like we were in just the enchanted forest yes. of frozen two, just Maybe raging on the flies off. for a little bit. When I got my shirt ripped off, that dude, yep. you yeah. Bud's shirt fully <laughs> ripped off. We sky. had him up in the air. We were holding them. The, the, when we were getting everybody in the air. Oh yeah. No one was safe. Frank yeah. put that lady in the air. The wedding planner. Wedding planner. Yeah, the wedding planner of... got hoisted above our heads. Oh my God. Unwillingly. <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> Completely unwillingly. She was <laughs> Rightly so. She was not happy. No. She was not happy. We, no. She was a god, though. We were yeah. just, we were she holding her up like a, cha- like a she won the damn hyped. Super Bowl. Well, so what was happening <laughs> she was She should have like, been happy. Super Bowl. So Frank, Frank, <laughs> Frank is April. the greatest partier I have ever met. Yeah, he's a pro. Like, there's he's no pro. question about it. Yeah. And so what had happened was Frank, everyone's pretty Frank blackout. April. Everyone's pretty blackout drunk at this point. Frank was going around lifting up all of the relatives of Lauren to make them feel welcome. Yeah. To make them feel welcome. There's a photo of Frank Hulk Hogan style arm between my mother's legs, (laughs) my mom and my mom's like arms out laughing so hard. Like so, so time of her life. So in Frank's, in Frank's defense, 
he was like, people were down. Yeah, they it were was, loving it. It was their kid's wedding or whatever. Yeah, all ages. A good time. Yeah. And then, you know, this this lady, Frank, went up and I guess kind of bear hugged her and tried to get her up. And she, like, lost her mind. At least she didn't rip her shirt off. Lost her mind. Yeah, um, it, it's yeah, it's a flattering thing to do. I don't yeah. understand. She under, didn't understand yeah. the gesture. I guess. Yeah, it was a, it was a wild, wild evening. A lot of people <laughs> say best wedding ever. That that was actually. Best I mean, ever. in your speech, we had we had Chris, you know, do one of the speeches. Good there speech. was a Deflate Epic. Gate reference about me emptying or draining my balls later yeah. that evening. Yes. He gave my wife and I Patriots jerseys that said. Uh, Mrs. Birdman with the number one, and then Birdman number sixty nine. Sixty nine. Gotta go sixty nine. <laughs> it was. He said he was gonna murder the dance floor like Aaron Hernandez. This is, is in a speech with like my grandparents. Allegedly, I should say for legal speakers. <laughs> it was like my grandparents were sitting right there. I think it all kind of went over their heads, but people were like roaring. And the coolest Cheers. part. Here's the coolest part about the wedding. And and I don't know if this interests anyone, but it's it's really uh, sentimental and important to me is when we kind of walked out, you know, me and all my groomsmen and then the bridesmaids and stuff, everyone was sitting in this concrete amphitheater and there's like music playing. Um, and I was the first one to come out with my stepmother and my mom behind me. And I remember thinking like, these people are going to fucking explode. Like I thought, it, Lauren's like, do you think they're going to cheer? And I was like, oh yeah, dude, they've been drinking. Cheers. They've been drinking for like two hours. So they're yeah. going to go nuts. So I walk out there and I'm kind of expecting people to woo. Like, Hey, the place went fucking nuts. I felt like a sports star. Yeah. It was incredible. It was like the coolest feeling I've ever felt. In my I was life. with Mary and I remember being like, what people are cheering. Yeah, everyone's just like, what? <laughs> For every single person. And they're cheering for yeah. us. And it wasn't yeah. even my wedding. I'm just yeah. <laughs> and that's, I mean, that just goes to show that, the, the life that my wife and I have chosen to lead has just surrounded us with like incredibly passionate, loyal, unbelievable people. And I'm like, I'm so thankful for that. Absolutely. Dude. Our yeah. community has some incredible people, Thanks. cast of characters. It's unreal. So much love. And yeah. we're noticing that doing the podcast, just seeing that I, as well. You know, I firmly believe, I, I don't think there are other industries quite like this one. That are that are so communal and so accepting, and everyone is so happy for someone else when they. It, it, there's not a lot of competition in it. It's just yeah. a it's a family vibe. It's like let's hope everyone does good. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Our homies' success is our success. Yeah. And so on and so forth. Straight we up. All feel it. And then for you, uh, as far as your role, you know, editor, the mag, and all that stuff, and then you started to kind of transition into some of the announcing stuff. You've made Skip you've made mic. a pretty damn good career out of announcing since yeah. then. Yeah. And. Uh, I just want to let you know that I went through some of your uh, webcasts yesterday and oh, pulled no. a couple sound bites out oh, of them. No. And I handed those sound bites over to Harry Hagen, <laughs> the ledge. And um, he produced nothing short of a masterpiece with a couple of oh, your uh, Jesus. beautiful sounds. So, okay. so here, here you have it. Dirty, 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 Cab 1080, Cab 1080. He's gonna get docked for that little bobble. He, he, he's gonna get docked for that little bobble right. Half cab on 50 50 back. Half cab on 50 50 back. Five out. Put some respect on my name. Oh my. <laughs> That's a hit, huh? <laughs> um, not a lot of people know this, and <clears throat> it's interesting because I do so much announcing, but I really don't like listening to myself. Like, I've never gone back that. and watched a webcast just because I can't do it. Like, I, it comes out, we say what we say, and then I just move on. It's yeah. like the next one, you know? But, uh, yeah, it's it's announcing is super fun. It's, I guess in my career, I've always wanted to be much like snowboarders, right, and other photographers. Like, you want to be as well-rounded as you possibly can. Like, yeah. I don't just want to shoot street. I don't just want to write. I don't just want to announce. I want to do all of it. You're you a know? media army, dog. Not an army, but maybe a militia. Maybe a militia. <laughs> Maybe a militia. Maybe a um, southern militia. We, we were joking. Smaller. You could have just interviewed yourself. We we actually, really you know what we do? I actually, I pulled a sound bite where you actually can interview yourself. I have a quick, uh, this is your own, this is, this is what <laughs> you gotta we're going to answer do. your own questions. <laughs> you got to answer your own question. Here we go. Said, what's your mindset? What are you thinking? Right now I'm thinking this is a pretty interesting way to do an interview, <laughs> T-Bird. Um, <clears throat> may I also say that you're looking incredible today, my man. <laughs> You're looking good, dog. 
sound good. You look good. Any more questions? God, we're like me and me and Bud's are like done that the whole interview. He, he, he's <laughs> what so, are we doing? He's so much better at this than like we if we no, could just no, no, no. pre-record yourself interviewing yeah. yourself. We would have just sat here and pressed what buttons. What is yeah. your mindset? <laughs> what kind of softball question is that? What's your mindset right now? Yeah, but you're talking to people live at a contest. I mean, That's a it, good com- question. it comes at you quick. That's a good question. And I've I listened like to your show. You kill it, dude. I, I try. You know, I try. And obviously now working with like Tina Dixon, Louis Vito, and Sal, it's so much easier for me to do what I do because those guys are so, and girls are so good at what they do that I just have my little, you know, Bill Belichick, do your job. Just yep. do your job the best you can. And I don't really stray out of my comfort zone of being kind of just the expert. Right? Yeah. Let Louie call the tricks. He mm-hmm. calls the tricks. Huh? I call tricks yeah, in slow. Call, he, he's good, at, he's good at calling that, tricks. Dude. Louis calls tricks in pipe because that's just his world. Yeah. Like, he's so good at, at that stuff. Um, Sal's just a man. And Sal is just, he's the host, man. He's, yeah. it's crazy. He's another guy where like, I remember, you know, making my parents or my friend's parents drive us to Mount Snow for the X Games just so we could see like, J.P. Walker, Barrett Christie, Sal Masakela. Yep. I think I like high five Sal just like without him knowing it. Yeah. Like I might have just hit his hand yeah. as I was walking by being just like, hyped. I got a high five. Because <laughs> that, that dude was like the voice of snowboarding yeah. growing yeah. up. It, it, it had never been done before and we didn't have like a like a Bob Costas or like a Al Michaels or anything like that. Like that is who he is to me, right? And so it's still just crazy getting to sit down in a booth with that guy and being like, how the fuck am I here right now? Like, how did this happen? Did you ever see him on the E channel? Oh yeah. <laughs> my, yeah. My chick met him once and she was like speechless. Cause it was this homie. I mean, dude. I was like, this is my wife, Angie. She's just like, it's funny. Cause we, you know, like headlights. when we're in Vail, it's a pretty small little village and we're on the jumbotrons all day, you know? So like, we'll be walking through Vail or whatever and going to get a bite to eat after broadcasting after a long day. And a million times, Oh, you're Sal Masakela. And I'm here I am just getting ready. Like, here we go. Let's give out some handshakes, baby. And then they're just like, hey, can you take our picture? <laughs> I'm just like, fuck. Oh, no, they hit you with that. I mean, they love Sal. Yeah. They, they love Sal. He's just, he's an incredible. He's been around human. how many years? Jeez, dude. I mean, he did take a little bit of a break yeah. there and did some like more mainstream TV stuff, but he's fully back. Like he's been in it for probably longer than I've been snowboarding 27 28 years the dudes they're incredible. like they're like hey Sal hey hey you look a lot like Danny Bonarducci will you take a picture <laughs> hey Danny hey Sal Danny. what are you doing hanging with Danny <laughs> Danny grab this camera oh man but Sal's one of those few people I've met and you're like larger than life and you're sitting I've just sat down with him like at a bar top and just he's just cool as hell the coolest dude yeah, like the exactly. term don't meet your heroes does not apply to that guy yeah, like exactly. you meet him and you're like this dude is so much cooler mm-hmm. than even I thought he was, yeah. which was really cool. He's, a cool you know, yeah, like, dude. he's just such a nice guy. And there's so many people I can Smooth. say that about in the snowboarding industry. Like so many of my heroes I've gotten to meet and I, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but it just trips me out. It just absolutely trips me out. Yeah. Our community is unreal. There's a lot of, there's a lot of incredible people. Yeah. Sure. And if I could just go back, you know, I'm 38 going on 39 now. If I could go back and have a conversation with, my 15 year old self, <laughs> there's no way 15 year old Birdman would, would even believe ever it. believe it. Yeah, going to the ever. X Games. Hey, in, in 15 years, you're going to be sitting next to this guy in an announcing booth. Yeah. Sal Masakela. Like, like calling the show. Calling the show. Yeah. It's pretty wild. Yep. Um, Insane. But again, it's like just, I've always wanted to be really well rounded. It's, it, I, I have this like fear of getting pushed out of the industry. You know what I mean? I just have this like underlying fear that eventually people will get sick of me and maybe not want me around or any of that stuff. So I've just always tried to like be better at or be good at a lot of things. Maybe not just great at one thing. Jack of all trades, master and none. I'll I'll tell you from my perspective, it seems like you have that just New England gritty work ethic where it's like, I'll write a full feature story sitting on the toilet and then I'll go announce this contest and I'll just... I'll just work you under the table. That's what I'm going to do. The way you edit your photos before you even like sit down. (laughs) (laughs) It takes me, grind your nose, it takes me months. (laughs) You're like done one hour after the session. You get send them to his phone. You're making me look bad. Honestly, that that. that ties back to when I was younger, that like crazy ADHD that morphed into like this weird OCD that I, that I currently have. Like, it's it's a borderline obsessive compulsive disorder that I kind of can't control, but I've found a way to harness it and make 
make it part of my like work ethic, routine. my work routine. Yeah. I'd go to, to your to, office at work. You put a pen on his desk. This fool is tripping like everything's like OCD. Dude. Be, nope, that can't be there. This is over <laughs> here. But stop putting that there. That's this is what, over here. That's what all that crazy pent up like energy that I was putting out into the universe like funneled into, which is, which is very odd. I, I don't yeah. know how it happened, but it drives my wife nuts. But then, you know, what's crazy is when I think about OCDs, sometimes you have to like let that go a little bit when you, now that you're a dad, right? For sure. That not to jump too far ahead, but no, no, that's, right? I mean, that is of all the, of all the stuff I've ever done in my life, there is nothing more important than being a dad. Like it is hands down the coolest, hardest, most challenging, most incredible thing that I've ever, ever done. It's, it's wild, man. We got this little two and a half year old kind of semi maniac running around the house named Eloise, but she is just so funny, man. Like every single day she makes me like fall to my knees laughing because you're just watching this little thing blossom and like snowboarding aside, <clears throat> that's my legacy, right? Like all the shit I did over here, she's going to think that shit's lame when she's 25. She's going to be like, dad, I don't care. Like whatever. Yeah. I could show her all this stuff. And all these tapes of me announcing and snowboarding and, and photos that I've shot, it's it's what becomes of her is what I what my wife and I are ultimately going to leave behind, right? So, but yeah, you got to have like, it's so hard to keep clean with her. She makes such a fucking mess. Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> yeah, throw the OCD Dude, out the window, yeah. take the Legos, dump you, them on the floor. You just have to let it go sometimes yeah. and just say like, you know what? I'll just clean this up later. I'll just deal with this later. So it's well, like that's kind of her involuntary way of making me like a better person. Yeah. <laughs> in yeah. a way. That's she's awesome, awesome too, man. She's, yeah, incredible. she's incredible. Shout out to Lou. Yeah. Um, I bet about a bunch of people listening have probably seen her on Instagram. Yeah. <laughs> and I only post the good stuff. We don't post the, the crazy stuff. Yeah. It's much harder than it looks. Yeah. Well, one thing I remember hearing before she was born, you had a pretty traumatic experience with Jeremy Jones yep. and that, um, avalanche and whatnot. And I was wondering a, how that was for you. And, and if that changed your perspective on family and all that stuff, it lit that, that day, January 11th, 2017, um, changed my perspective on everything, like literally everything, because it was an incredible day that, you know, the start of the day was one of the greatest days of my life. The end of the day was probably my, my worst day <clears throat> ever watching, my childhood idol. Like when I was a kid, Jeremy Jones, Salt Lake, Jeremy Jones, TRJJ was literally Superman. He was hands down for many years, like my favorite snowboarder of all time. Um, and then I, you know, was lucky enough to become really close with him, and we're really good friends now and watching this dude get into a helicopter with two broken legs, knowing that, you know, I don't know if he's ever going to come back from this to what he once was. It, still weighs on me it still hurts you know like everybody there that day there's a crew of 11 of us um we got him out we got him the help he needed but at the same time you're, you want to just give for the listeners that don't know it just a quick backstory yeah. cliff notes sure. of what happened yeah um and so yeah so we uh went out with this um kind of rogue cat operation and so we you know start uh cat boarding and the avi conditions were considerable maybe touching on high a little bit um and we take three runs stay in the trees it was incredible it was fucking awesome and we're just amping right so get back in the cat go up for one more run it's probably like 3 30 at this point um and jeremy was like yo i'm gonna drop this little rock and we had kind of tested conditions and felt pretty comfortable letting him do it everyone had eyes on him drops off this little rock uh quick head over heels ragdoll and as he gets back to his feet just this boom, like this crack. And yeah. it was this kind of wide open apron um, in between these trees, flushed out. Our buddy Mike uh, Nelson was down there. Um, Giant avalanche for people that don't <clears throat> understand the terms. Basically. Yeah, sorry. It, 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 it avalanched yep. really big um, and actually broke down to like a secondary crown, which made the residual debris much higher. And so Jeremy hit a tree with his board, um, broke his legs. Our buddy Mike was buried. Uh, we searched for Mike, his transceiver, unfortunately was off. Um, oh, wow. so we didn't find him when we got down radio back up, let him know. Um, Seth Hewitt, the general saves the day, found Mike's, uh, kind of board sticking out of the snow, dug him out. Wow. 
Mike was good to go. He came too. And then it was time to focus on Jeremy basically. So at that point we had all kind of made our way back up and, you know, we get Jeremy down, stabilize his legs. Uh, Brock Harris was the dude who just took full control. And, and if anything, what it taught me was there are times to step up and then there are times to know when to fall back, you know? So everybody, more experience, everybody huh? in that crew knew as soon as that happened by the actions that were immediately taken, that, it was, it was Brock and Seth's show, 100%. So then we just became the secondary cast. Get Jeremy back down to the cat. Um, it's probably like 7.30 now. We have no cell service. Our wives are freaking out. And so we start um, uh, taking the cat back to the trailhead. Evac. And the cat breaks down. Like the gearbox exploded or something like that because it was an old cat. So myself and Seth and Mary Walsh uh, like just sprinted back to the trailhead like, I think it was a mile and a half, two miles. And Jeremy's doing okay, but he's not going to be doing okay for much longer. It's getting cold. Drive to cell service, call the sheriff. Sheriff comes and meets us. We see the heli go overhead. And then that's when we kind of knew everyone was okay. But it was, you know, <clears throat> it's Jeremy's story to tell. Um, but there's, it just still sits very heavily with me. Yeah, you know, a like scary one. It was, a, it was a crazy day and it was a shitty day. Um, but at the same time, everything that could have gone wrong for us did in an instant, but everything that could have gone right for us did in the long run, which is why Jeremy's good now. And to yeah. see the place that he's currently in is mm-hmm. fucking amazing. Mm-hmm. He's, he's arguably more influential now in the industry than when he was a rider. He's, yeah. he's doing so much cool stuff. He's got a speaking series and he's doing the Woodward stuff and, um, and you yeah. played your part to save his life. You ran <laughs> full speed back from the cat. And so you know, you had a crucial part. Everybody played their role in order sure. to keep this guy alive. And <clears throat> from my perspective, it almost seemed like, you know, that was two weeks from your daughter being born, if I'm correct, right? It was, yeah, it was close. It was two weeks after my wife had told me that she was pregnant. Oh, that's mm. what it was. Okay. Yeah, so she had let me know that she was pregnant. Heavy you know, life A couple moment. weeks before that. And then that, yeah, that just fucked my mind up for a really long time. Because yeah. it, it was a, it was just a rock that was six feet tall looked yeah. fun you know like i wouldn't i wouldn't go so far as to say that i wouldn't have jumped off it mm-hmm. if i had seen it first yeah. right it was just this fun little playful slope that just turned so fucking savage in shit gets real fast blink of an eye and you know i had seen things that had that had precipitated what did happen like little incidents here and there in the back country landing slides out your buddy gets half buried and yep everyone's like woof, that was crazy could have been worse mm-hmm. And this was unfortunately like it was worse. It yeah. was yeah. it was shitty. It was bad. Um, but yeah, it was just crazy because, you know, I was gonna be a dad. I knew that. And just it puts a lot of stuff in perspective for sure. And so, you know, one of the first things I did was signed up for Pat Moore's Abbey class. Yep. Nice. In Baldface. Like the most comprehensive yeah. class that you could possibly take, led by, you know, Pat and John Buffery up at Baldface, who's the best in the world yep. at avalanche mitigation. So like, <clears throat> I'm going to try to go back to that every single year. If I can't make it to that, I'll make it to something else. Just, just to keep things in perspective. Get on Hewitt's level and Brock's huh? Exactly. Well, these so these mountains, they're fun. They're an awesome time. It's oh, you're having a blast, but they're, they can be deadly and people need to be serious. And about it's a split sure. second. That's yeah. the scariest thing. You in lose, your life we've changed. lost a lot of people yeah. in snowboarding. Cause totally. Of them and we all get too comfortable. And yeah. it's, I look back on it and like everything that, I could have personally done, I feel was correct, but I still didn't find one of our homies. Yeah. Right. Yeah. (laughs) Like that it's, it's looking at it in retrospect and saying like everything I did when it happened was correct, but I could have gone back earlier in the day and done this, this, and this had eyes on them to exactly to to help mitigate. And that's the thing. It's better to take an avalanche course now because if your friend gets caught in a slide, you're going to wish you had more knowledge for sure. You know? So it's like, you're telling that from experience. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, But you know, on another note, seeing what Jeremy, you know, what he sustained that day, I don't really don't know many people that could have handled it like he did. Like I, I know personally, I, I would not have handled it the yeah. same way he did. That dude is, if anything, what it did was make me realize that he is in fact fucking a superhero. He's got, yeah. you yeah. know what I mean? Like everything I thought about him as a kid is, is correct. It's verified now. Yeah. Jeremy Jones yeah. is such a legend. Um, you talked about big mountain, Jeremy Jones and Jeremy Jones street. Yeah. Kind of a lot of Jeremy wow. Jones. A lot of Jeremy Agri- Jones. Who's the real JJ? I don't, I don't even <laughs> both know of anymore. Them. Both, yeah. of them. both of them. Both of them. Both of them. 
Um, and then, so, uh, yeah, and then kind of one thing, you were working at the MAG for a really long time, and I know this is maybe we're jumping around chronologically, but you ended up leaving Snowboarder MAG, correct? Yeah, I did. So it was... Um, yeah, how long at the MAG? I think it was... 13. Almost 13 years. 12 and a half 13 years. 13 years at Snowboarder MAG. Dumb. And <clears throat> so, you know, I was living in, in Southern California for a really long time, and eventually I just really wanted to move back to the mountains. So we came to Salt Lake, kind of fell in love with it. Um, you know, we're lucky enough to buy a house and settle in and make a family. And so I wasn't going anywhere. Right. Um, and that was a risk. You know, I knew when I moved to Salt Lake city that I couldn't be insulated if there were in fact layoffs. Um, so one random night, it was right before SIA kind of get this text from our old general manager. Um, he's like, Hey, everybody fly to Southern California right now. I still didn't really think anything of it. Um, and, you know, I rented a car, was staying in San Diego with my buddy. I'm driving up on the five to go to the office and I get a call from Bridges and he's like, hey, what time is your meeting? And I'm like, 1115 uh, in the skate park. And he just goes, fuck, let me call you back. So I'm like, oh, it's kind of weird. So he calls me back and he's like, all right, you're going to have to prepare yourself. You are getting fired today. And I was like, Dude. oh, shit. That's crazy. And technically it wasn't fired as my position was eliminated. Yeah. Um, but the corporate policy for American media was that. You're fired. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. A little late. Continue. Uh, the, the corporate policy for the company that was purchasing um, uh, all the action sports titles, American media, was that they just couldn't have any full-time staff living uh, out of remote the office, league. living yeah. remote. Right? They were the only and one so, in Salt Lake. Yeah, so that was that was the end of that, um, and it was it was a crazy experience. Here's kind of a funny story. I had to give up my cell phone, right? And so I go to the uh, Sprint store, and you know my wife had called and <clears throat> um, told them what had gone down or whatever. And I'm I'm sitting there in the in the Sprint store waiting in line, and some guys like, "What's your name?" I'm like, "Oh, Tom Monteroso." My wife called, and he's like, "Oh, okay." There's like a bunch of people standing behind me. He's like. Hey, uh, Karen, can you grab this guy's cell phone? That's the dude who just got fired. <laughs> and I was like, Son of a bitch. You're I think my fired. wife. I think my wife just said like, "Yeah, he just got laid off, and he's gonna jump on my plan." Guy, this fucking hey, dude. Hey, this like, guy just got fired. Can we get him a phone. <laughs> <laughs> I actually sick. laughed. I was like, "This is kind of funny." God damn it. Um, and so you know, that's that's what happened, and it just made me realize that you know the group of people that work at Snowboarder are just fucking phenomenal human beings. They're family to me and I love them all. But the giant entity that lives above it is, is very corporate. They don't look at things as people on the ground who are passionate about snowboarding, who are creating content for a very devoted audience. They look at fucking P and L. I mean, spreadsheets, spreadsheets and yeah. Excel sheets. And you know, they shut down trans world a month later. And that was crazy to think that, you know, over 30 years of snowboarding history, just, a blink of an eye. Just yeah. gone, you know? Crazy. Um, but what it really did for me too is, you know, and that's that's also where my fear of getting uh, passed by, by the industry really kicked in. That's when I was stressing. My, Chick, it's real. My wife kept me so cool-headed. Like, she's such a good voice of reason to me, but I was panicking. Um, but my first phone call, you know, I was also, um, I had a side hustle with Ride Snowboards going on as their staff photographer. That contract was coming up. I was like, fuck, if that thing goes away, like the snowboard industry is going to continue on and I'm just going to be kind of stuck here in the dust, right? And I'm going to have to figure something out. The very first phone call when I got my new phone, new number, I lost all my contacts. Um, I had to call my wife. She sent me Pat Moore's number. I texted Pat and said, send me all your numbers. And then I texted Aaron Blatt and was like, send me all your numbers. And I was just gaining all these contacts back because that's really my body of work is the, the snowboard industry as a whole and who yeah. I know and who I can reach out to yep. on a whim. Um, and so the very first phone call I got was Tanner McCarty at Ride Snowboards. And he's like, yo, I talked to Jim. We're re-signing you uh, to another multi-year deal. We fucking awesome. got you. We got you. You're good to go. That's and so dope. I, like I almost legit cry. Yeah, he had your back. And that was it. Burn and, that, man. <laughs> and that's when I was just like, okay, people aren't going to forget me. I'm still a member of, course, of this community. Three year deal, course. right? Uh, he's always, he always wants to know much money. He's always trying to pride. <laughs> yeah, don't, don't even you. let me give no me a comment. <laughs> <laughs> no comment. 
he's always trying to talk <laughs> cheddar but biscuits. That, you know, that's when that's when you you really see the community who who truly Who's cares got about you, back. you. Not saying whoever didn't reach out doesn't care yeah. about me. I know they do. But the the true good core homies that I've met that I've created these like lifelong bonds with you guys yourselves included, they're never going to fucking forget you. I could go work do an IT in a cubicle in Salt Lake City, and you guys are still not going to forget. Yeah, our friendship, Absolute, man. Right? Absolutely. Um, and so, yeah, I'm still the staff photographer for Ride, and um, we actually just signed a deal through Homestead Creative. Aaron Blatt, Ryan Runke, John Cavan, Joe Carlino. Um, we're going to be me and Cavan are working on a 30 year history of Ride Snowboards coffee table book and full length documentary. Year. Mm-hmm. Thirty year. Yeah, yeah. Started awesome. in '92. Dope. And you, you still announce. And still announce. And it seems like you're doing well for yourself. Yeah. yeah like it seems like you pick up all these jobs through Homestead, doing cool stuff too, exactly. right? Yeah. yeah. When you it's, got let with go with Snowboard or, or the job got removed, part of you, and I know I went through this, part of you start to think like, ah, oh, it's going to be hard for them to do it without me. Definitely. And yeah. And then and all of a sudden you realize, shit, man. <laughs> totally. And that's, yeah. that's, the, that's the fucking ego that comes with it. Right. The ego that I associated myself with where it's like, well, if I'm gone, there's no fucking way they can do it. That's such a dumb way of yeah. thinking. I now you know wake that. up quick. Yeah, you wake up quick and you're like, OK, they hired Stan. Stan's killing it. They got Clavin. They got married. They got Pat. They got the core still intact. And what they're putting out is super cool. But it was at first there was I was bitter. I yeah. was fucking bitter. Naturally. Because, you know, I was like, well, fuck, 13 years there, yeah. 12 and a half years there. How can it go on without me? That's a horrible way to think about it. How, I wish I could go back in time and just be like so thankful for everything everyone's done, which I am. Yeah. Where do I go now? Well, it's a lesson you just learn with experience. For sure. And until you go through it, and, you're yeah. not going to learn it. There's two things I was hearing that I picture Johan from Capita saying he'd always be like, it's it's not what you know, it's who you know. And yep. that's like, and look at him. He's killed it with C3 and all that stuff. And totally. yourself. And and that's good advice for people that think that it's all about the piece of paper when it's it's about building your, your community. It's and building, networking. Building your friend and, and yeah, having those people you can call on. Every, every opportunity I've ever been granted is because of the people I met, not necessarily because of the skill set that I have. Yes. It's knowing the right people, getting your foot in the door, yeah. and then not letting someone fucking wedge that foot out. <clears throat> from from under you, you know? Totally. Um, and I will say this too. It's like Tanner was the first person that called me. The second phone call was Blatt, Aaron Blatt. And he was like, I got you. Dog, like, I didn't have your number, man. I know you did. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I called you for my no, new we phone. Talked, we talked. I called I got your new on, number. Yeah, I got your new number. Yeah, yeah. You hit me. Oh, yeah. yeah. 385 area code. Yeah. Well, that's good. Um, and Blatt was like, yo. I can't believe you went 385 on him. I didn't. It was just assigned to me. The guy that harsh, yelled harsh. he was fired is actually the one who he picked yeah. the area code. Let's hit him with a 385. Let's hit him with a 385. He just got fired. Let's give him a shitty area Let's code. Let's give him the whack area code. <laughs> no, but the, the second phone call um, was Blatt, and he's building this thing with Homestead. And he's like, I got you. And sure as shit, he just started like flowing me work. And so I've kind of gotten into that little business with those guys and shit is like firing. It's Dude, good. that's so sick, really man. You cool. deserve it's it, bro. It. You're so talented, man. Thanks, yeah. man. Covers yeah. behind you. I mean, you're a fucking legend. And it, it would have been... Autofocus, baby. <laughs> yeah, it's a hell of a, <laughs> hell of a drug. Huh? So Autofocus. What's crazy about this photo is do you remember the shoot that was going on? So Blum was getting higher and higher. I was like three feet next to you. Dude, it was an amphitheater of photographers. They used, they used his photo. <laughs> it was yeah. literally like when you were going through... I gave through, him a nod to do it. I mean, I was kind of the editor at the time, too. I, I just chose <laughs> my own photo. Ah, stony buds. Let me just take that put we're, that in the trash can. We were such say? good friends. We'd sit three inches from each other, our cameras, and just shoot the shit. I was, was like, what does important. that file say? Oh, shit, delete? <laughs> delete. Damn, was that Stones? No, it was funny because uh, the all the... Mine was probably out of focus. All the Scott Blum photos from that Super Park, it was like one of those X Games yeah. fucking cams. We could have like, gotten three, <laughs> 3D yeah. fucking multi Course preview. I think, <laughs> I think Stone was here and Oli was here. Yeah. I remember they were like, is it T-Bird or Oli? Yeah, T-Bird no or Oli? And it was just no like... No one knows. Da, 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 yeah. da. It was His funny for was us when we there. get that bag in the mail, we're like, me and Oli are like, oh, that's my photo. <laughs> <laughs> and then you're oh, damn it. That's T-Bird's photo. <laughs> And the same shit, the same shit with the Scotty Vine photo, yeah. the sunrise shoot. Next you to know? each other, it was just like six the same in the stuff. <laughs> I got a question for you. Buds, every time I shoot with him, his lens is completely whoa, dirty. Whoa. It is That's so sauce. dirty. That's and he's seasoning. Wipe he, that no, shit he, claims, nah, he claims that like, it doesn't matter. That's my signature. He claims it's his signature, signature move is the dirty lens. He claims it's like the grandmother's like kettle pot yeah, that like over time <laughs> it's like, the, it's like the, the food Chinese 
Chinese it wok, it dog. It's creates like more wok. flavor. <laughs> Straight it, uh, up, I'm creates, like, yo, your flavor. lens it's is like looking look. fucked up, man. You're like, yo, this this photo Eastone just shot has like a MFM 2004 <laughs> look. <laughs> the, the, the vibe, dude. It's all about the vibe, and you need those those like seasons, like, dog. It's like some fucking sunscreen, like avocado <laughs> mixed in there a little bit, dude. One time, someone was talking about you put Vaseline on your lens to fucking give it that softness in certain areas. <laughs> Fuck, I was a young kid, dude. I think Andy Wright was probably pulling a joke on me. <laughs> Fuck my lens up. I had to get a new lens. Dude, this shit never comes off. That's bro. incredible. That's yeah. unreal. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Season your lens. That's my only recommendation. Season the lens. claims dirtier the better. Clean. But I know that I know you keep yours crispy. See, I, I can't let that happen. The more you that's, touch it, the more you're jacking it no, up. No, that's dude. like the OCD like in me. Like when I put so so when I shoot a photo, do you look through your right or left eye? I'm a left eye on. I can't so, even wink. You look through his I brown can't wink eye, my I other eye. Yeah, I do brown eye. Left eye. But I can't wink my other one. You look through your brown eye and then your pink eye? Yeah. <laughs> speaking, of, speaking of pink eye, dude, I heard pink eye Barcelona might be a keyword. Oh, trigger, my God. Trigger word for you. You almost got out of this thing alive. <laughs> oh, my God. Did you talk to Eamon? Of course I did, dude. Oh, <laughs> trigger word. Christ. He said, key, it's all he said. Oh. Pink eye Barcelona. All right. So a little backstory between me and Eamon. He's my best bud who's ever lived. Best man like, in your wedding. No offense, Stone. You're that's, top, that's you're top five. That's fucked up. Top five. I, I mean, I was top three last You're time. top three. You're Thank top three. Eamon is Eamon's the guy, right? Eamon Rivera. He's so the guy. so much so that when I was working at the magazine, Bridges would just let me bring Eamon to Super Park, buy him all his booze, his food, and Eamon would become like the runner at Super Park. He'd go get pizzas for people, pick up trash, all this stuff. So <clears throat> this is an also another testament to how incredible my wife is. Over my wife's 30th birthday. She let me get on a plane and go party with Eamon in Barcelona for like six days. Insane. Nice. Unreal. Um, and so we had some of our buddies from England come down and meet us. We call them the idiots. They're incredible dudes, too. The it was idiots. just It was just a whirlwind. <laughs> call them the idiots. They're great like guys. Some great guys. They're, they're, they're just a great they're, bunch of guys. They're incredible. Um, and we met up with Tomas from Method yeah. Man. Oh, yeah. Tomas. Yeah, when he was over in Barcelona. So Cash? he gave us, like, he had, like, the keys to the city. We were just going to every cool bar, went to an FC Barcelona game, just whirlwind partying, right? I used to party quite a bit. Don't party as much anymore with the kid. Um, and so the very last night, Eamon and I are drunk in the streets of Barcelona, and he, like, takes me down, and I kind of thwap my head a little bit, and I might have been a little concussed. Instead of Eamon helping me up and being like, oh, is he okay? Pants, underwear, down to his ankles, <laughs> sits directly on my face. Oh, I didn't know that's where we were headed with this. I didn't know where we were going, <laughs> no yeah. idea. And he was doing it, and I think in the photo, he's, like, giving a thumbs up oh to our buddies. God. That's they, unsanitary. They yeah. took a photo of it. So then the, I had to fly out the next morning to get back to SoCal and I had like a 7 a.m. flight. So I like get to the airport and I get on the flight and Eamon was like, do you remember me sitting on your face last night when you were drunk? And I'm like, what? And no, it was a cell phone photo. And he texted me the photo. I'm like, you motherfucker. <laughs> like, that's crazy. <laughs> and then I don't no know memory. if it was like placebo effect or I got lost in my own head. But I'm like sitting on the flight. I'm like, oh, man, my eyes are itchy as fuck. Like, this is crazy. Then I go to the bathroom and they're both just fucking. <laughs> That's and I'm how like, you get pink eye. Poop poop particles, particles, it's poop particles. I'm like, yeah, no, it's a poop dude. Particles, he gave me it. fucking pink eye. Double pink eye. And I had to go back to work like the following day. And, and then you so gotta, people ask. You so say, here's I had how, some poop particles in my eye. Here's how Eamon and my relationship work. I was like, okay, I'm not going to tell anybody about, about this. If I call in sick for work, I'm not going to say what it's for. Because if I let Eamon know that he did this to me, I'm never going to hear the end of it. Yeah. So I just didn't tell him. Long story short, get back to Southern California, take a shower, go to bed, wake up the next day. I'm totally fine. Oh, nice. So I think I just gotten lost in my own head. But for that entire, like, you know, 11 hour flight from Frankfurt to San Fran where I had a layover, I'm sitting there and I'm like, I how, got how do I play this one, dude? I got <laughs> gnarly pink eye right now. Hey, what what were you saying in Kazakhstan? I remember you you said something about oh, like yeah, you found dude. a cure for pink eye. I uh, I Googled this <laughs> once. I was traveling. I had to go to a sales meeting, and I had to talk in front of like 100 people. Just got pink eye while I was traveling. <laughs> how? how? That's a good No question, comment. Dude. Maybe I a mean, no comment okay. can answer. You know, my camera lenses are dirty. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> I'm sure the eyepiece is really dirty. Uh, you squeeze a little lemon or lime in your eye consistently over like once every hour for like a day. Pink eye cured. How severe was the level of pink eye? One to ten. It was, dude, it was bad. Like an eight? <laughs> it, was, it was a pink eye, man. 
Wow. I'm not talking brown eye. I'm just one eye. It's, it's, who, one eye. What about the announcer that had during the Olympics? Remember oh, that? yeah, Bob Costas. Bob Costas got pink eye. Yeah, and he was trying to make fun of Sage and shit. And it was and after he, he can't made, make fun of anybody. It was after he like made fun of snowboarding. Yes. Just because he didn't know what he was talking about. Yeah. And he called it like like ridiculous activity or something like yeah. that. Yeah. And then, yeah, like three days later, he's like, Hi, I'm Bob Costas. My eyes are super fucking <laughs> Dude, He would have squeezed <laughs> he a like little a Iron Man. He would have been cured. It that hurts. Was, you should have really called Stony Buzz. He would have yeah. been fun. That was insane. Yeah. Fucking eye doctor, dude. You Get should be a, a life coach. Yeah, I would love Stony to. Stony Buzz's life coaching. Yeah, yeah. I, squeezing limes in kids' eyes and my dick out of my box at all. Probably get arrested, dude. We just started this. We just started this with the story of Stone's dick out. <laughs> And ended, ended it with the story of Stone getting <laughs> curing pink eye with a fucking lemon. <laughs> oh my oh, god! All right, yeah, holy, s- holy shit, we did it! All right, oh, we're man. gonna take it away with a little actual Birdman. Thank you guys for tuning in. We'll see you next oh, we week. Still recording. Twenty inches pop off, the Birdman. Dead, I fly in any weather.